Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this lecture, part of the Cat Center's Zoom series on the history of Jewish magic. I'm Ann Albert, the Clatt Family Director for Public Programs here at the Cat Center in Philadelphia. And I'm very pleased to be here to host Professor Andrea Gondos today. The present series in which today's talk is the second of four planned programs explores how magical traditions have shaped and been shaped by Jewish ideas, practices, and experience from the ancient world through the present day. So last time, two weeks ago, we heard a broad overview of these traditions. Today, we're jumping into the deep end of one particular historical, intellectual, religious context, that of 18th century Eastern Europe, and particularly the world of Baalei Shem, or masters of the name. These are these itinerant miracle workers who are known for deploying magical and mystical knowledge and techniques. They are, of course, the reason for the name of the figure known as the founder of Hasidism in this same era, the Baal Shem Tov. But as we'll hear about today, they also constituted a wider non-Hasidic practice that holds a lot of interest in its own right. So to lead us through this fascinating material and the amazing sources that reveal it, I'm very happy now to introduce Andrea Gondos, who is currently a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Religion and Classics at the University of Rochester. Before this, she's held an array of impressive postdocs and fellowships, including at the Free University of Berlin, Tel Aviv University, Ben-Gurion University of the Negev, the Oxford Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies at the University of Oxford, and of course, far and away, the most important at the Katz Center, um, almost 10 years ago now. She has become over these years an important contributor to the new, a, a kind of new vanguard of scholarship um, on mysticism and magic in Judaism, especially that of the early modern period with a number of publications, one of which is called Kabbalah in print, the study and popularization of Jewish mysticism in early modernity that came from SUNY Press in 2020, so you can find it. And she also recently co-edited a volume that should appear later this year called The Life of the Soul, Jewish Perspectives on Reincarnation from the Middle Ages to the Modern Period. Her latest research centers on gendered aspects of healthcare and well-being in early modern Jewish magical and Kabbalistic recipe books, or these books of secrets, and that is material that we will hear about today. So Andrea, if you um, want to join us here on camera, I'm so pleased to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you so much to, um, to Diane and Brian for uh, this wonderful series on magic this fall. Uh, thank you also to uh, the Cat Center director, Stephen Weitzman, uh, for all of you to uh, include me in this very special series coming on the, on the heels of Professor Gideon Boha, whose works obviously, and of course, influence my work. But before I start, I also want to give a special thank you to Agata Paluk, uh, with whom I worked for four years and who introduced me uh, to this incredible magical world of the Bali Shem, of these Eastern, Central and Eastern European manuscripts of secrets. Uh, we had a wonderful collaboration for four years at the Freie Universität in Berlin. Uh, and I really thank her um, uh, uh, for this special opportunity. Uh, for, after the thanks, let me just share the screen and um, jump right into the presentation. And one more. Could you just let me know that you see the screen? Yes, it looks great, Andrea. Thank you. Perfect. Wonderful. So um, let me begin. Again, thank you very much uh, for everyone uh, for coming to this presentation and sharing your lunch hour or dinner hour with us. I would like to start off by posing a series of questions. And these questions, I hope, will help to frame our discussion of Baal Shem, introducing this concept of a Baal Shem, uh, and understanding who this group of healers were exactly. So these are the questions we're going to begin with. What does the term Baal Shem mean? Why are Baal Shem important for understanding and reconstructing pre-modern Jewish history? 
How do they fit into Jewish society, in gen to general Jewish society? As cultural agents, what did they produce and how did they contribute to knowledge? What was their unique worldview about the cosmos, the natural and the supernatural worlds? Why was health so central to their daily work? And as healers, how did they harmonize the natural and the supernatural? We're going to try to find answers to these questions first. So the term Baal Shem means um, wielder of the name or uh, master of the name. And it refers to obviously the names of God, so divine names. And we already encounter a number of divine names in the Torah, in the, in the Bible, uh, some of which are uh, the Tetragrammaton, the Yod Kevavke, uh, Elohim, El Shaddai. So there are various names to which, of course, Jewish tradition and Jewish magical and mystical traditions have added throughout the millennia and throughout the centuries. So they're wielders of the name and knowers of the name. Gershom Sholem, the pioneer of uh, the academic study of Jewish mysticism in the 20th century, defines the Baal Shem as a man who knows the secret of the name, the Shem Mephodash, the ineffable name of God and other holy names and knows how to carry out magical operations by using these divine and angelic names. So there are two aspects here to how Sholem defines Baalei Shem. On the one hand, they have knowledge about names, divine names, angelic names, also perhaps demonic names, as well as they have some kind of technical operational knowledge that allows them to carry out various uh, magical operations. These Baalei Shem, uh, I argue, also embody a kind of charisma and charismatic forms of leadership that are key to understanding the emergence of, of Hasidism later on. Max Weber's definition of charismatic uh, leadership, the sociologist Max Weber, captures some of the defining characteristics of a model of mystical leadership we encounter widely in the history of Jewish mysticism, from the depiction of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in the Zohar, to hagiographic accounts about, about Isaac Luria, the Ari, or about Israel ben Eliezer or the Besht. But this type of leadership is not unique in Jewish mysticism, and we already find such um, healers and charismatic individuals in Talmudic Agadah, in Talmudic uh, uh, Midrash, uh, where we see Honi, uh, the, um, the circle maker, and others who have certain special powers that Jewish communities recognize and who are able to somehow interfere into uh, the regular course of nature and bring about certain uh, special results for the sake of the community. Um, Max Weber says the following about charismatic leadership. It is a certain kind of quality of an individual personality by virtue of which he's set apart from ordinary men and treated as endowed with supernatural, superhuman, or at least specifically exceptional powers or qualities. These are such as are not accessible to ordinary people, but are regarded as of divine origin or as exemplary, and on the basis of them, the individual concerned is treated as a leader. So he already touches on a number of um, salient points that define Baalei Shem, and that is that the knowledge that they have is not acquired through intellectual uh, sophistication, through rational thinking, but rather aligns much better with the etymological root of charisma, which is a gift. So it's a gift that is bestowed by the divine from God, but it also then alludes to um, some of the, um, the difficulties with this type of leadership, which is that it is an unstable form of leadership. It can be diminished and it can change um, from one day to the next and various events can um, remove the authority from this type of individual. And we certainly see this in Shifri uh, Habesht, in the hagiographic accounts about the Baal, Baal Shem Tov. We also see the account of Hilal Baal Shem, who we will encounter later on in my presentation, that 
For instance, when an exorcism procedure goes awry and it doesn't bring about the required results, or God forbid the individual dies in the midst of the procedure, then the Baal Shem loses his authority. So it's a volatile form of authority. Um, according to another definition offered, offered by Nimrod Singer in his very important book on the Baalei Shem, uh, these individuals are charismatic religious adepts who possess certain supernatural knowledge and whose authority and power are defined by the practical efficacy of such knowledge. Reference to this group of religious experts dates back, so this word Baal Shem dates back to the Middle Ages in Jewish sources, and more specifically, we encounter this word in the responsum of Haigaon to the Jewish community of Cairo I. Their healing practices can be differentiated from those of learned physicians, so it's important to keep in mind that their knowledge and their expertise is different than the knowledge and expertise of um, learned physicians, although sometimes they do build their uh, system uh, of therapies on already extant uh, uh, knowledge of Galenic uh, medicine or the humoral theories, which comes up several times in the various recipes and undergirds the recipes um, they offer, the, particularly in the realm of uh, um, materia medica or natural forms of recipes. Um, um, they also derive many of the ingredients for their recipes, both from the realm of nature, so natural forms of recipes, including plants, um, uh, flowers, fruits, trees, uh, animal parts, various parts of animals, but also from the supernatural realm using angelic names, uh, divine names, as well as interesting geometrical forms, such as squares, um, the Star of David, uh, and sometimes even humanoid forms. It's very important to emphasize that they served a crucial function in Jewish communities in East Central Europe as healers who attended to all forms of affliction and disease, physical, mental, and emotional at the same time. Before university trained Jewish physicians became more ubiquitous or widespread, uh, which only happens after the middle of the 18th century in East Central Europe, the Baalei Shem were the primary experts to treat the sick, particularly in small village communities, remote rural communities where Jews lived and which were sometimes very difficult to access and almost inaccessible, particularly in the winter months. In terms of their um, social, um, social function and where we can plot them in Jewish society, they belong to secondary elites. Some of them were uh, entirely itinerant and lived their life going from one community to another, while others, other Baalei Shem, were more sedentary and were leaders of their communities. And we certainly see, we also encounter preachers among them, such as Yaakov Pesach uh, from Zhul Kiev. Um, we also encounter like the Baal Shem Tov, who was later in his life uh, supported by the community. Uh, Joel Halperin or Joel Halperin of Zamosh was also sedentary um, um, Baal Shem. And some of the sedentary Baal Shems who were tied to a specific community called themselves uh, as Baal Shem Tov. So there was, there's a, a feature that distinguishes them. And it seems to me, once you are supported by the community, acknowledged as an authoritative Baal Shem by the community, you acquire the name of Tov. So Tov gets added to your name and you become a Baal Shem Tov. And uh, such person was also Ephraim Reisler, the judge of Jesov in Poland. So um, uh, we also um, uh, encounter them. So a very important part of their life is being on the road, even in inclement weather, 
of long Polish, Ukrainian, Belarusian, Lithuanian, and Russian winters, they moved from community to community. This type of movement, this itinerant lifestyle, lifestyle or peripatetic lifestyle, exposed them to a number of dangers on the road, not just the cold weather, but also robbers, wild animals, and other dangers. And we're going to look at some of the amulets because we find in many of these um, uh, recipe books um, squares of amulets that, um, that address dangers on the road and, um, and prefer safety for the wearer. And this was, of course, very important in their daily life because if they could not get, uh, if, if they are injured on the road, or if um, robbers attack them or God forbid, murder them on the road, then this important mission that they are on, are unable, they're unable to fulfill their important mission to bring healing and therapeutic remedies and potions to the next community that they are about to visit. Um, we also have um, uh, a very important conceptualization of their mission, uh, which um, uh, Benjamin Benish of Krotogin articulates in salvific terms. They see themselves as saving individuals, saving Jews in these various communities, Jewish individuals, but also uh, contributing to the continuity, to the well-being, to the health of the community. And he says the following, just as it is a sacred obligation to arouse all of Israel to follow the path of the fear of heaven and of penitence, so too a person must save the souls of Israel through charms and cures. Um, in terms of um, these recipe books, so for uh, Benjamin Banish, uh, the, the idea that the Baal Shem needs to bring healing um, to communities and individuals becomes a kind of religious prerogative. Uh, in terms of uh, these recipe books, we find that uh, they, there's a wide range of, uh, uh, in terms of content, in terms of language, and in terms of depth of knowledge um, that we encounter. I looked at um, more than a hundred of these manuscripts. Some of them were very short, uh, very concise, and tended to be written in Yiddish and focusing more on natural potions and natural remedies. Whereas the one that you see on the screen here um, is a, a, a composite manuscript that tends to have um, a, a sundry recipes uh, for various um, health issues, toothache, headache, stomach ache, um, fire uh, that might plague a community, robbery, all kinds of social ills that would plague a community, also against the plague, so, um, so larger pandemics, uh, and, um, but also alongside these, um, these kind of medical therapeutic recipes, we also find very important uh, tractates um, and fragments of uh, practical Kabbalistic works or Kabbalistic treatises um, that are included and copied into the, these um, uh, important recipe books. And so some of them are very vo voluminous. Hillel Baal Shem's volume is more than 400 or around 400 folio pages. There are other such large manuscripts. And again, it attests to uh, the, the knowledge and uh, the background um, and the learning of, um, of the writers of these works um, and whom they studied with. So if we see Lurianic fragments and Lurianic textual, um, textual uh, units, uh, obviously that person had access to Lurianic Kabbalah, uh, uh, where, whereas it's important to emphasize that not everybody had access to Lurianic Kabbalah um, uh, at this time. So in terms of the language that they are written in, um, most of them are a combination of Hebrew and Yiddish. Uh, again, the ones that deal with more natural remedies tend to be more in Yiddish, and they all contain uh, some um, sporadic words uh, thrown in, in that are uh, adapted from uh, the uh, Slavic milieu that many of these Bali Shem worked and moved in. So 
after discussing this, let, let me look at uh, five larger topics uh, through which I'm going to introduce some of these recipes. And uh, these are going to include communicating with angels and demons. Um, we're going to look at radically different seals and angelic alphabets that we can encounter in these sources. We're going to look at one exorcism procedure. It's another form of communication, this time communicating with the dead. Um, we'll look at amulets and spells facilitating safe travel. We'll look at natural substances, the use of natural substances, like um, it's not bad brain, but raven brain, um, the recipe that I brought today for treating a variety of health problems. And finally, we're going to look at um, a magic several magic squares for women's health, uh, for easing uh, birth, and also a very special um, uh, amulet um, that is quite rare, again, for women. So let me um, first uh, look at uh, language. And it's very important to emphasize here that uh, language is at the fulcrum, at the center of a Baal Shem's activity. You're, in order to bring about a practical operation and affect health, uh, you need to be able to communicate with beings, um, with supernatural beings. And these are often obviously angels and demons. Um, and therefore, what we find in many of these recipe books uh, are alphabets that we don't really encounter in other um, normative Jewish sources. And the first one um, that we see here on the screen is the kind of ocular um, name of the tetragrammaton. It's the yod He vav He that you see in front of you, which is expressed through lines and little circles. And the circles have uh, the eyelashes, what looks like what look like eyelashes on them, uh, which uh, can be defined as crowns, uh, like the tagin that we see on letters in the Torah. And there's, uh, of course, important esoteric uh, understanding or esoteric uh, uh, symbolism behind uh, the, the number of these uh, little eyelashes or crowns. If you add them up, um, they add up to, um, to 72, denoting the 72 letter name of God. Um, and I, Agatha uh, Paluch um, just wrote a wonderful uh, article about uh, uh, including this name and this particular manuscript. And I included some further readings for you at the bottom of some of the, um, some of the slides. So um, if you're interested in this, I invite you to, um, to, to read this important article that she recently published. So, but, but this particular um, depiction, the ocular depiction of the divine name is not unique in this particular manuscript that is housed at the National Library of Israel. Um, it, we can find this also in other manuscripts. It often relates to, to, um, uh, to protection against demonic beings that cause epilepsy. Sometimes it's used in the context of exorcism uh, and um, and, and also the context that Agatha is discussing it is against plica polonica or uh, matted hair disease that plagued a number of Jewish communities in East Central Europe in, early, in the early modern period. So we see um, also that if you add up the first, second and third letters of the name with the little Crowns on them will yield 45, and this is the 45 letter name of God. But what I also brought on the right hand side of the screen is another recipe, and this one is against fear on the same page of this large manuscript compilation. And here you see the P, uh, the letter P uh, in the middle. Um, uh, Pahad El is the name of the angel that is being summoned or adjured in this uh, magical amulet, and the P it, or the P is um, is formed in a circuitous way, in a different way than what we are used to. But I also brought other examples from um, from large manuscripts, and um, and this one comes from the Gross Family Collection. 
And I also should mention that these manuscripts are today scattered all around the world. Um, JTS has a number of very important manuscripts in North America. Um, there are also important manuscripts at the Bodleian Library, which is an important repository for these magical manuscripts. There are other ones here throughout libraries in Germany, in Frankfurt, Hamburg, uh, Switzerland, in Zurich, and also very large repositories at the National Library in Israel, um, as well as in private collections. And I would also like to thank uh, William Gross, who um, is uh, one of the prominent uh, uh, private collectors of magic uh, from very early on in his career as a collector. And he always graciously shares his books, his um, uh, uh, objects, his magical objects in his collection with scholars, uh, and really is just a paragon of a gracious collector who allows scholars to uh, to work with and 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 uh, access his vast collection, which he recently, I believe, sold to the National Library. So it's now also available to the public. It is in this manuscript that we find these very interesting um, uh, seals. And I've highlighted a seal of the angel uh, Tzadkiel. Um, there's a taxonomy of, uh, of various angels and the corresponding seal to them. So the angels you find um, denoted on, in the right-hand column. In the left-hand column, you see the seals corresponding to them. And the one that I've highlighted is the angel Tzadkiel, he corresponds to Thursday, the fifth day of the week. Its planet is Jupiter, and its horoscopic signs are Sagittarius and Pisces, and this is its seal. So if a Baal Shem wants to um, adjure this angel, he needs to be able to access this seal, know this seal, and use this particular seal uh, in the amulet that he's about to write. Uh, here we have another taxonomy of seals and uh, from the same manuscript. And you see these very strange um, uh, um, figures and very strange seals that we are certainly not used to. And the one that I've highlighted in the middle is, um, is uh, corresponds to the angel Barkiel. You see Barkiel at the top left-hand corner of that square. Uh, and um, he uh, is appointed in the um, month of Av, in the Hebrew month of Av, and his uh, horoscopic sign or mazal is Aye or lion. Um, we also have, again, in the same manuscript, a number of angelic alphabets. Again, a Baal Shem needed to know the alphabet through which they can contact and communicate with various angelic beings, because the, um, the, the underlying uh, understanding is that each angel is responsible for a particular function. And so you needed to address an angel through these various alphabets. And what you can see here, and I just have to move um, this a little bit so I can see on my screen, you see that I've highlighted the Alephs. We have several alphabets listed one under the other, and some of them um, correspond. For instance, uh, the angelic alphabet number one that you see is similar to the third uh, one. The second is similar to the fourth, but we see some other ones below where the Aleph is depicted in a different way. And uh, the scribe also indicates uh, the Hebrew equivalent to each of these angelic letters, which are called characteres. And here I've included um, Professor Gideon Bohak's wonderful work on the characteres, which originate from the um, uh, Greco-Egyptian context. And these are letter-shaped signs. They are also they also make their appearance in other. Um, magical texts in antiquity and throughout the Middle Ages in Christian works as well. Um, uh, they are letter-shaped signs or symbols often lacking uh, a distinct semantic or phonetic association used in magical texts and amulets. And from here, we're going to leave 
um, uh, this form of communication. And we're going to move on to another form of communication. And this time it will be communicating with the dead. And I know you will have a wonderful speaker in Professor Yof Yossi Hayas in the next session who will be speaking about exorcism. So I will limit myself to this one example that I worked on and included in um, in the reincarnation book. Um, and it's a slightly different than uh, possibly some of the exorcism stories that he will uh, bring for you. So this um, text that I will show you in a moment comes from uh, a large compilation, Hilal Bashem Sefer HaKeshek, or Book of Longing. Um, and uh, again, this is uh, this was a, a manuscript discovered by Professor Petrovsky Stern at Northwestern University uh, in, the, in the early 19... Uh, um, 1990s. Uh, we, he discovered it uh, at the Vernetsky National Library in Kiev, where the manuscript is still today. And it's a wonderful manuscript. What sets it apart from other large similar manuscripts is the personal voice that Hillel Bashem includes in this work. Many of the uh, most uh, of the other works, in fact, it's quite singular that um, uh, most of the other works is are are descriptive, uh, and they, we do not really hear about the life of the Baal Shem um, who wrote it, or we do not have any uh, biographical information or autobiographical information about the editor or the author. Here in Hilal Bashem, he um, brings the uh, the uh, reader into his own world. He discusses uh, personal details, where he travels from and where he's going, the various problems and issues he encounters on the way with um, rabbinic leaders in various communities, um, uh, as well as, as some of the difficulties. And he also comes into contact with, uh, with non-Jewish forms of magic, which he includes, and sometimes polemicizes against uh, various um, uh, magicians uh, or witches or um, sorceresses that he encounters on his, on his many travels. So, uh, here we have, um, and I included a picture uh, about King Solomon and Ashmodai, um, and he um, tells us, Hillel, at the beginning of this book, um, how he came to study um, Jewish magic. I, Hillel, lowly and scorned, turned away little by little from the preoccupation of this world. I searched and investigated thoroughly all the methods until, with God's help, I found healing for several medical conditions, as well as many magical charms, kulot, that Ashmodai the king revealed to King Solomon of blessed memory. And I toiled with God's help in various communities and in diverse areas as people saw and can solemnly testify concerning what they saw clearly with their eyes and heard with their ears. They will testify with God as their witness that it is all reliable and true. And here he's promoting his own magic. It's authoritative, it's reliable and true, and I have witnesses. Therefore, be exceedingly diligent to ensure that this holy book, his own recipe book, gets into the possession of, on, of, one, of only the one who is truly pure, a person who acts and conducts himself in an appropriate and pleasing manner, and who investigates rigorously how to bring himself close to the performance of a particular operation, and who is scrupulous in writing its consonants and its vowels, as I thoroughly explained. And here is the um, exorcism in Austria, uh, in Poland, that he describes in the 18th century. Um, it unfolded, the event unfolded in Austria, which at this time belonged to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and was distinguished by the prominence of its rabbinic leadership in the 16th and 17th centuries, Rabbi um, Shlomo or, or Solomon Luria, the Maharshal, and Rabbi Shmuel Eliezer Edels, respectively. The narrative is based on a series of dialogues that transpire between the exorcist and the evil soul, the Ruach Ra'a, that proved to be transformative and contribute to the eventual success of the operation. And I should also mention that recently, um, uh, Maurice Firestein published a wonderful book about the book possession. I didn't have a chance to put it on the slides, but I will so that once the presentation will be posted, that will be there. Um, uh, it's a wonderful foray and introduction to the book possession in East Central Europe at the time. 
Hillel Baal Shem's uh, axiomatic statement concerning exorcism as a procedure that can be influenced by multiple factors which lie beyond the control of the Baal Shem, such as time, the Sha'ah, the time when it's, um, when it's um, executed, where the space, the Makom, become a central pivot of the narrative. After several unsuccessful attempts to drive out this evil spirit, Hillel tells us that from this, the body of this unnamed woman, a procedure that unfolded over the course of six days, as he tells us, the evil spirit, which is identified by the name of Ayin Yod, Ayin Yod, Ayin Yod Mem, that I have on the screen, initiates a conversation with Hillel Bashem. Through the revelations of this spirit, we learn that he had taken hold of the woman at night after the conclusion of the Sabbath day, a propitious time for evil spirits to restart their malicious activities. When she was pregnant with a little girl and had continued to possess the woman for several years, the demonic rulers appointed over this spirit um, gave him permission to kill the woman's husband, but when he wanted to proceed to slay the child as well, he was forbidden to do so. Only her husband met his end. But when I desired, he says, and I'm quoting from the work, to kill the fetus, the fetus in her womb, they withheld the permission from me. The demonic spirit plays a pivotal role in the narrative as an interlocutor between the earthly and the preternatural realms, disclosing hidden knowledge, both concerning matters in the heavenly realm, as well as transgressive acts perpetrated by the Jewish and non-Jewish communities, and specific techniques to aid and facilitate Hillel Balsham's therapeutic work as an exorcist. So there's a very interesting dynamic unfolding between Hillel, the Balsham, and the evil spirit, which is ultimately dialogical, it's a very important aspect of their mission that it's based on dialogical operations and rests on verbal exchange, discussion, and conversation. Echoing Hillel's earlier statement that sometimes a magical procedure is influenced by unseeable forces, time or the hour of the operation, while at other times it is impacted by specific place and the negative energies accumulated there, the demon warns him that the exorcism must be moved to a nearby village, possibly to Tushin, which was approximately 52 kilometers north of Ostro and should not be conducted at the Ostro synagogue, a site of unholiness where all his efforts and techniques would ultimately fail. The demonic soul's confession narr narrating the transgression committed are framed by Hillel, I would contend, around a clear dialectic, didactic and morally exhortative agenda against apostasy, a ubiquitous concern in East Central Europe in the aftermath of the Sabbatean movement in the 17th century, and then in its aftermath, the Frankists in the 18th century. The religious boundary crossing, the demonic spirit perpetuated in its earthly existence, that is conversion from Judaism to Christianity, and the murder of his former co-religionist in his earthly life is paralleled by its restless crossing from the dead to the living and back, all the while inflicting danger, pain, and death. The pregnant body of the woman he possesses mirrors his own existential state, liminal and between worlds. Expectant mothers were particularly vulnerable to the harmful activities of demons, Jewish myths preserved in the alphabet of Ben Sira depicts Lilith as Adam's first wife, who was banished from the Garden of Eden to persist in the wastelands of the created world, from where she sends her armies to snatch and kill the fetus of pregnant women and small children after they are born. It is interesting that in this particular case, the demonic spirit was not given permission to harm the child, only the mother. So let's read this um, section, uh, this, this small uh, passage together. And the spirit recounted before all the people and gave testimony of the deeds he had committed in the past. He became a heretic, may his name be obliterated, and married a non-Jewish woman and fathered many children with her. 
He then murdered several Jews, and when they wanted to bring him to justice, he became a priest. After many years, he turned into a spirit and lay below a tree in the holy community of Ostro, adjacent to the synagogue. During the hot days, on account of the immense heat on the holy Sabbath, the above-mentioned woman who was pregnant went to the tree and lay down on the ground beneath it, where the demonic spirit resided. Immediately, without delay, the spirit entered the woman through the right eye and harmed her sight, and on the same night he hurt her husband until he died. She then delivered a baby girl, and the child was healthy and strong, and the spirit returned into the woman's body for seven consecutive years, during which he tormented her greatly and bitterly without measure, so much so that he harmed her other eye as well, because of the intense pain she endured. And there was none, no expert, who knew what happened to her, what the spirit did to her. The entire incident remained concealed. So, in, in, for the sake of time, I have more to say about this, but I'm looking at the clock. And for the sake of time, I'm going to move on to the next um, um, type of uh, amulets uh, that I brought for you today. And these have to do with safe travel. So let us look at the first one. Um, this amulet was ascribed uh, to, uh, to Nachmanides Ramvan, the leader of the um, Spanish community, the Catalan community of Gerona or Gerona in the 12th, 13th centuries. And uh, we, uh, we um, encounter Nachmanides in a number of amulets that are ascribed to him in these various recipe books. This is a received tradition, the, the um, recipe says, from Nachmanides, may his memory be blessed to be used when you set out on a journey. Take some salt in your hand and repeat the verse seven times over the salt, a song of ascents, those who trust in God are like Mount Zion that cannot be moved, enduring for, forever, from Psalm 125.1. Then cast the salt in front of them or between the robbers. Recipes um, attributed to uh, recipes attributed to Nachmanides, his name, recur regularly in diverse magical formulas, lending authority to their deployment and efficacy. The use of salt has been well documented in Jewish folk remedies as an effective substance against the malevolent influence of demons. The insertion of a psalmic verse further activates the recipe's efficacy and fits into the rich tradition dating back to late antiquity of using verses or entire sections of the biblical book of Psalms for diverse magical functions and frequently producing amulets. The rules governing the use and combination of psalmic units to uh, bring about powerful uh, or to produce powerful angelic and divine names that could be conjured for a specific um, practical purpose or operation extended to all aspects of daily life, from the protective healing acts of childbirth, bodily aches and pains, and exorcism, to more destructive and morbid operations of aggressive magic intended to harm, subjugate, and destroy demons or human enemies. Tra the travel chest of these Bale Shem, which they carried with themselves with their prized recipe books, managed to blend a natural substance in this particular example, salt, with its primary nature to arrest expansion and growth. In this case, the malicious intention of robbers with the apotropaic use of sacred writing, Psalm 125, with its emphasis on endurance, permanence, and protection which offered security to its owner against the countless dangers that lurked on the road. The next recipe just is against uh, fear on the road for one who goes out at night so he would not fear evil spirits. Even in a place of danger, he should take a loaf of bread, again, a natural substance in his right hand and in his left hand, some garlic, and no harm will come to him, God willing, who saves and protects. And note 
And notice here that there is no specifically Jewish element in this particular recipe. It's, um, it does not include a verse from the Bible or for Psalms. It's uh, a nature-based recipe that may have been also adapted from the non-Jewish milieu. And finally, we have a recipe against the raging sea, to quiet a raging sea. Um, write the name uh, Aleph Gimel Lamed Aleph in a continuous line and throw it into the sea and the waters will be calmed at once. Alternatively, you can etch the name Aleph Gimel Lamed Aleph into the side of the ship, saying this name with an addition of Yod Resh Aleph, who raises this being, uh, who raises to save in the waters of the sea, should hasten to save me. So there's an aspect where the person who is doing this operation also needs to pronounce this spell. Um, it, this, it's important to mention here that the that the that the word um, this word uh, Aleph Gimel Lamed Aleph is an acronym that is formed by the initial letters of the second of the 18 benedictions, the Shmona Esri, or Amida prayer, um, the high point of the daily liturgical cycle, Atta Gibor Leolam Adonai, you are forever mighty, O Lord. This name is frequently deployed in magical recipes. We encounter it many times, especially for controlling natural elements, such as fire, in this case, water, uh, large bodies of water, such as waters of the sea. The apotropaic effect of the amulet is realized through the dissolution of the divine name into the surrounding waters. Um, and, and finally, or not finally, um, almost finally, we are going to look at uh, materia medica or nature-based cures. Quickly, um, here we have um, recipes um, to... Um, to foster and um, to intensify uh, uh, desire and sexual vigor and sexual performance uh, for, uh, for males. Um, the first recipe uh, in, uh, includes donkey hair for binding that is supposed to be, um, that you're supposed to bind to the right toe. Uh, take three pieces of donkey hair and make rings from them, then place it on the right toe and you will be able to have sex all night. And whenever you feel like extinguishing this great desire, take the rings and place them on the left toe. And this is tested, says the scribe. The second recipe uses um, raven brain, another recipe for a person who's not able to engage in intercourse. Take the brain of a raven and smear it on the penis and his vigor will be strengthened immediately. And we encounter the donkey hair recipe uh, also in a Persian, uh, Persian uh, book um, um, with magical recipes and the, uh, and the use of um, animal brains um, has also been attested to in the work of Maimonides, Moses Maimonides. He has, um, as Gary Boss um, beautifully illustrated and translated, uh, a tractate on, um, on, uh, on sexuality, and uh, he prescribes the use of, um, of raven brain, um, oh, not raven, raven brain, as well as uh, other um, bird brains uh, for um, invigorating sexual, um, prow uh, the sexual prowess of a man. And finally, um, before, my time runs out. I would like to quickly look at um, uh, at least one magic square. Uh, here's a, a very interesting recipe uh, with multiple alternative recipes uh, for women. The first one is for a difficult birth using um, using the magic square uh, of three by three. And uh, if you add up the letters, they equal 15. Um, there's another recipe that the scribe immediately includes below it, also the letters adding up to, um, to 15, but the second recipe needs to be um, uh, placed on the forehead of the woman. Uh, the first, the first um, uh, three by three squares, two squares, uh, lined side by side are um, also surrounded by psalmic verses and these verses are from Psalm 107 
those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death shackled in affliction and iron. And the other one is from Isaiah, opening eyes deprived of light, rescuing prisoners from confinement, from the deepest dungeon, those who sit in darkness. And again, both of these verses uh, are meant to, um, to help the birth, to bring the child, the fetus out from the darkness, the dungeon of the womb into light and life, lest it gets stuck in there and God forbid dies in, in, uh, in the mother, which we have recipes for that, unfortunately, as well. Okay, so my time is up. Let me just offer a quick closing, um, a few closing words. Health defined as physical, mental, and emotional well-being was of paramount importance to Balei Shem, who saw themselves as essential conduits to communal continuity and well-being. Their technical knowledge encompassed both natural and supernatural remedies, combined at times with canonical textual sources, such as the Hebrew Bible, as well as traditional liturgical sections um, that were drawn from prayers. Unlike other models of rabbinic leaders and leadership centered around synagogues and houses of learning or Bate Midrash, the peripatetic lifestyle of uh, many of the Bali Shem or the majority of Bali Shem brought them closer to the hearth and to the homes of all segments of Jewish and sometimes non-Jewish society. They were boundary crossers from the center to the periphery between Jews and non-Jews, heaven and earth, the normative and the antinomian. The gradual printing of secrets of their secrets and uh, some of these recipe books starting in the early 18th century, coupled with the penetration of Haskalah and enlightenment in Eastern European society and the rise of larger cohorts of university trained physicians divested from their power and um, their influence. Their commitment to wholeness and holiness however, continues to reverberate throughout their sometimes messy and sometimes ordered, but always illuminating handwritten recipe books. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. There is so much here and so much to talk about. We'll try to cover what we can in a few minutes. Um, and thank you to all of the people who have been posting their questions. I always um, find it just as interesting to read how people are thinking about the material out, out there. Um, as, as to hear about the material. So the first question um, that I wanna bring um, has to do with uh, women themselves, potentially as healers. So someone has asked about the, um, what they call the sexual division of labor. And what they're asking about is, were there in fact midwives, female healers, women who did similar kinds of procedures or complementary ones um, in these same contexts? Yes, so from the manuscripts that we have, we encounter women very rarely. These all are male experts, male Balisha, and in Hillel's work, we encounter his polemical um, tone against some of the um, uh, female healers that he encounters on his way, uh, and he always writes them down. So um, um, only at one point he says, I learned this secret from uh, a sorceress in Prague. He doesn't tell us whether she was Jewish or non-Jewish uh, and doesn't name her and includes the recipe uh, in his own writing and in his own voice in his recipe books. So if there are women, the the voices of women are muted, uh, and 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 are the male um, uh, healers and Bali Shem uh, do not um, illuminate uh, their voices uh, as they probably should have. There, we do need to remember that there was great competition. In, uh, in, in, in the medical realm. Uh, there are various types of healers with Nimrod, which Nimrod Zinger beautifully illustrates in his work on uh, the Bali Shem in Germany um, at various levels of society, at various levels of training. I should also mention that Jordan Katz, who will be speaking, I know, in the spring, she looked at different forms of evidence. So much depends on the kind of evidence that we look at. 
in these particular manuscripts, we do not encounter the women because these male healers wanted to obviously sell their own wear, their own form of healing, their own expertise. This is what supported them. This is how they made their money. So um, the, the competition in the, um, in the medical marketplace was also an economic competition. But it's hard to believe that there were no midwives when they went um, to a difficult birth or that they did not pick up information or recipes or ingredients or exchange recipes with, with female midwives who were at the birthing stools uh, uh, at, in these various uh, Jewish homes that they visited throughout their travels. And she looks at, uh, oh, I just wanted to mention that she looks at uh, uh, communal registers. So there she is able to, um, to, to bring information from, from those sources um, uh, where you encounter women. Again, there's not a lot of biographical or autobiographical information, but at least she's able to, um, to trace them uh, and they are, you know, through, through how much they were paid, et cetera, in these communities. We do not have that in these recipe books. Thank you. It is tantalizing for sure. The reference to the to the sorceress in Prague, and yeah, for a little bit of plug uh, for the the spring series, there's a lot of overlap with this one in a certain way. It's an entire series about um, Jewish women as patients and healers. So the history of of medicine as it relates to Jewish women. But continuing along this this line of thinking, because you brought up. The, the sort of economic market and the competition between different kinds of healers. Um, I wanted to share one person posted a, a kind of maybe sarcastic comment. If the, if the Baal Hashem had heavenly knowledge, why weren't they safe on the road, right? Like if they were able to make these things work, um, why wasn't it just taken for granted? I think that the question speaks um, maybe to a wider question about authenticity and about the degree of belief, even in their era, um, yeah. and possible perceptions of quackery or chicanery, right? To what extent do we think, and, and maybe Hillel Balsham's emphasis on um, his, his remedies being true and tested speaks to a potential skepticism on the part of his, his customers. So can you just speak to that kind of economy of belief and use of these remedies? Yes, yes. so... Um... This is also a very another very interesting recipe um, that I recently translated uh, that will be coming out in JQR in the spring in a in an in an article uh, where he talks about um, a male and female couple where the woman believed in amulets and the man did not and the woman came to him and took his remedies um, and amulets and, and uh, the um, and Lilith was coming, coming um, toward them, disguised as a male priest, and wanted to perhaps convert them, wanted to give them a remedy. And the woman resisted this male priest, fell on the amulets, slept on them all night. And he concludes this story, this short um, narrative by saying, from then on, she was saved from Lilith and from all harm because she believed she, and he also describes her as a learned woman and somebody who had great standing in the community. So he holds her up as an important example who believes in him, who believes in his, uh, in his expertise as a Baal Shem. Um, that also provides us a very interesting um, uh, example to some of the difficulties and challenges that they encountered as Bali Shem. And he also discussed, he he also discusses Bali Shem that he encounters who whom he deems as, as uh, false. They are false Bali Shem, but I am the right one. I am the authoritative one. Ultimately, though, I think, and they keep coming back to this, and 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 the very fact that we see such um variants to the same uh, physical condition, ultimately it was the efficacy of a particular remedy that would attest to um, the charisma, charisma and the uh, authority of a Baal Shem. Ultimately, the remedy had to work. If it didn't work, you would then go to the next healer because everybody wanted to get well. Um, and, uh, and so that, uh, yeah. I think it's I'm not like getting a second opinion if you can't have your yes, <laughs> yes, have your yes, problem resolved. Yes. 
Um, following on that, um, there were a couple of questions about the the overlap with non-Jewish traditions or the sources of some of these either remedies or um, the angelic alphabets. Um, and uh, one of the questions was posed, I think, in an interesting way, which is, were these Baal Shem understood? Did they understand themselves? And did people see them as having creatively invented these remedies? Like, have they discovered them? themselves and do they somehow have a kind of ownership of the remedies or the spells that they're offering or is it more that they've found them and received a, a they positioning themselves as recipients of a magical tradition that they're then authorized by these these are wonderful questions thank you very much uh, to the uh, members of the audience who posed these questions uh, they see themselves and hillel comes back to this time and time again that he sees them they saw themselves as uh, receivers of traditions he um, repeatedly comes back to his discipleship under Tzvi Hirsch, uh, who was a uh, uh, leader of one of the Eastern European communities and uh, who was a Kabbalist, a uh, communal leader, a rabbi, and with whom he studied, who also uh, Kabbalah, as well as uh, Jewish magic or practical Kabbalah, he also lent him some of his books. So he also studies from books. Um, and as we saw in this particular exorcism example, he's also led by his interlocutors. So it is the Ruach Ra'ah or the evil spirit that teaches him. So there are many different agents who, who teach you, who you learn from. Uh, also, we had, as I mentioned, the sorceress from Prague. As they are traveling and wandering and um, peregrinating from place to place, they come into contact with various forms of knowledge and they pick them up and they incorporate them. But it's very rare that they would invent a recipe. I have, I have not come across, maybe someone else has, but I haven't come across somebody who claims um, to have invented a particular therapy. Sometimes they um, uh, correct certain recipes and certain names. So we see, uh, uh, um, editorial corrections, uh, scribal corrections, that obviously they saw a tradition in a book, but it doesn't seem to, um, to, to, to be the right one. And so they um, take the liberty to correct them. Thank you so much. That's really illuminating. If we have time for one more very short question, um, there are a few about uh, these books themselves, how many of them are out there, um, how much we're able to tell from them about the identities of their um, their scribes or their or their composers. So we you named a, a few, a couple of uh, Balashem, but are the majority of them like signed by their authors' names or or are they more anonymous? They are more anonymous, so only very few uh, contain the names of the of the scribe or the author. There are some like that. Um, um, one of the one of the larger manuscripts, um, uh, um, several of the larger manuscripts contain names. Um, they they um, I. We, we have looked at more than 100 and the list keeps go growing because some of them are hidden in, uh, in private collections and uh, the owners do not share the information. Sometimes libraries buy them or make them available. And so the, the list keeps growing. And um, as my colleague, wonderful colleague, Ali Moseson told me a few years ago, um, somebody came to a library, I think on Long Island, brought this special manuscript. Um, um, and and uh, he didn't know what to do. Somebody died, uh, and this uh, manuscript surfaced. That this was one of these uh, recipe books. So they keep popping up in different places, and uh, uh, the list keeps growing. Um, but um, we don't. Also, we encounter, uh, for instance, uh, earlier authors, medical authors, um, uh, Moses Tahalon, um, uh, an important uh, physician in Italy in the 16th century, comes up uh, in some of the, the works, uh, as well as um, Isaac Abraham Fortis is referred to. We have sometimes rabbinic authorities who are referred to. So that helps us trace the provenance uh, and perhaps uh, the place where scribes and authors came from. 
and also this the the paper signs if there are um, um, uh, signs of where the paper was made um, that also helps us amazing well I think a signal of all the work that's still to be done and that this is an ongoing story is a great place to end since we're out of time. I wanna thank you. This is really wonderful to listen to. Um, it's a, very evocative of a whole world that's, um, that's lost to us, but perhaps less and less so as you continue your research. So I wanna also thank everyone for being here with us and for your fantastic questions. And I look forward to seeing everyone back here in two weeks for um, Yossi Chayas' presentation about um, exorcism. And then we have one more additional after that about love, uh, love charms. So um, thank you, everybody. Take good care. Thank you very much.